Equip spells are some of the coolest cards in Yu-Gi-Oh! and natively come with a lot of fun flavor, as they enable you to equip your favorite monsters with powerful weapons, or adversely, give an opponent's monster a harsh status effect to make them easier to take down. However, some equip spells make it so you'd rather your monsters fought barehanded, and we learned about some of the worst of them back in 2020. And while the general qualities of equip spells has increased since, there are still some abysmal weapons, armor, and items in Yu-Gi-Oh! that would be better off melted for scrap. Which is why today, we're counting down some more of the worst equip spells in the game. The monsters they can help or hinder, and just what makes them so unworthy. Cutting into number 10 is Legendary Sword, one of Yu-Gi-Oh!'s first ever equip spells, and it definitely shows its age. You can only ever equip Legendary Sword to a warrior monster, and all it does is give it a minuscule 300 point boost to their attack and defense. This is a near unnoticeable buff even back in the earliest days of the game, where summoning the biggest monster could be enough to win the duel. As while you could definitely make your Celtic Guardian or Gaia a little bit of an impressive beat stick, you had way better options available to you, both in terms of the monsters you could summon and all the types and spells you could be playing. Now, Legendary Sword isn't the only equip spell of its kind. In fact, early Yu-Gi-Oh sets printed tons of specific equips for almost every type that, for the most part, were pretty synonymous with one another, with the only real variance being the strength of the monsters you could equip them to. But no matter what type of monster we were using, these equip spells were inherently risky because the moment your opponent could summon out a stronger monster, or if they had access to a piece of removal, you lost both your monster and your equip card in one fell swoop, losing two cards where you'd usually just lose the one. Which is why, instead of trying to force these relatively weak equip spells, if you wanted a way to buff your monster's stats to be bigger than the competition, it was safer to use field spells like Umi or Sojin. As, while they gave slightly weaker buffs, they increased the strength of an entire field at once, and wouldn't be destroyed if your monsters were somewhat dealt with, making them much more dependable options compared to equips at the time. Then, as the game progressed, these type-specific equips became even more redundant, as we received way more ways to deal with opponent's monsters, better field spells, and equips that were both powerful and much more generic, and could even turn the weakest monsters in the game into a dominant OTK enabler, which is something that the tiny increase in stats that Sword provides just can't stand up to. So as a result, the likes of Book of Secret Arts and Vile Germ have all pretty much fallen to the wayside, and have never really been used in a competitive setting. Every one of these early equips could probably fill up every spot on this list by themselves, but the reason why Legendary Sword specifically is on this list is because it's been made the most redundant, as Warriors have an amazing pool of great equip cards they can dip into, some of which are just complete upgrades of Legendary Sword in every way, with the most prominent example being Divine Sword Phoenix Blade, a very similar card to Legendary Sword that buffs your monster's attack by the same amount, but is almost overpowered because of its extra effect to reoccur itself from the graveyard by banishing two warrior monsters from your graveyard, an effect which was so busted when Parody Soul Day that Phoenix Blade ended up being banned in the OCG. But with cards like Phoenix Blade available in the TCG, there's never going to be any reason to run Legendary Sword above it in even the most casual of strategies. Overall though, none of these type-specific equips are really that much better than each other. A 300 attack and defense point buff on any type just doesn't do enough to make them worth playing, especially if you have better, stronger, and more generic equip cards available to use. Infecting the number 9 spot is Pestilence, an equip spell that you can equip onto an opponent's monster in order to weaken them. Any monster that's equipped with Pestilence has its attack reduced to zero, and will even burn the control of the equipped monster by 500 points during each of your standby phases. However, you can only equip Pestilence to one of these three types of monsters, Spellcasters, Warriors, and Beast Warriors. The actual effect of Pestilence isn't the worst thing in the world. An opponent's monster's attack being reduced to zero is going to be immediately threatened by even the smallest of beat stick allowing you to easily attack over or even OTK through an opponent's boss monster. But this potential usefulness is severely limited because it can only ever be used against three specific types. Warriors, Beast Warriors, and Spellcasters aren't uncommon types, especially in the modern era where the extra deck makes seeing these monsters even more likely, which gives Pestilence the chance to be a little bit more applicable. But it doesn't distract from the fact that Pestilence is still a hyper-specialized tool for these types that's going to rot in your hand, if your opponent happens to be on anything that doesn't need or end on them, which is a pretty big gamble to take in a game with 25 different types of monsters. But even if you happen to get lucky enough to be paired against a deck that mainly uses these types, you'd unfortunately just be better off using a generic option that's going to be more applicable into every deck in the game and more capable of clearing away your opponent's board without the need for a battle phase. 
However, despite how expendable Pestilence is, it was actually responsible for one of the very few emergency ban lists throughout the game's history. And you might think that it was because there was a specific format where Pestilence somehow became an amazing board breaker, or maybe because of a specific card that synergized the Pestilence and somehow made it broken beyond belief. But the reason why it was banned was actually a little bit sweeter. Because the emergency OCG ban list was made in 2021 during the height of the COVID pandemic where it became too dangerous to host in-person events or run promotions. And so, the hope that the pandemic would end as quickly as possible, Pestilence, which is known as Plague in the OCG, was banned for just under a month. So, while Pestilence is a mediocre card that's never going to have any real metagame impact, it's the only card on this list that you can feasibly be called ban-worthy, even if it's not for the reason most people would think. And brewing into number 8, we have Paralyzing Potion. Yet another early equip card that, despite being a potion, ended up aging like milk. All Potion does is paralyze an opponent's monster to the point where they can't attack. But for lore reasons, it doesn't work on machine-type monsters, likely because robots would struggle to drink it. Potion isn't the only card to have this weird quirk, though. As German Faction, another terrible equip spell that we've covered in the previous list, can't infect machine-type monsters either, which prevents it from being slowly chipped away at their stats, although in comparison to German Faction, Potion seems like a much better card, even if not by much. Preventing an opponent's monster from attacking is actually a decently beneficial effect in the modern era. If you can prevent your opponent from declaring attacks, you can save your board from being over or protect yourself from being OTK'd. And for certain strategies, one extra turn is all it takes to turn a duel around in your favor. But in almost every situation, Paralyzing Potion would never be your drink of choice. Potion can only ever stop a single monster at a time. And while that might help if your opponent has one particularly oppressive beat stick, you're going to need a lot more potions to stop an entire field from bringing the beat down. This is made even worse by the fact that Paralyzing Potion is solely reactive. You have to wait until your next turn after your opponent has summoned a monster before you get a chance to equip it to them. And by then, it may already be too late to stop them from pushing for a lethal. So instead of potion, if you really need to save your life points from an opponent's attack, there are a ton of easy to use but instantly powerful floodgates that can stop every single one of your opponent's monsters from declaring an attack, and proactively keeping your life points as a result. One of which was even printed in the set prior to the release of Potion, Swords of Revealing Light, somehow making Potion power corrupt even before it was released. Or if you prefer the reactive nature of Potion, letting you deal with an opponent's monster after it's hit the field, you can instead play cards like Dark Core, a Lightning Vortex, or any other removal option, as they prevent your opponent from attacking in the best possible way, by getting rid of all their monsters, thereby cutting them off from being used as any kind of resource. Since if your opponent is going to be vulnerable to a potion, they're likely to be even more vulnerable to a field wipe. But even if you need a card that specifically stops the attacks of a single monster by equipping to it, Paralyzing Potion is amongst the worst options you can play, because of its inability to affect machine monsters. So you can instead play Ikibio Dark Mort, which is not only going to stop the attacks of the monsters equipped to, it will eventually destroy it as well. So as it stands, Paralyzing Potion might be generically usable and have a pretty applicable effect, but it's so low impact when compared to other cards that can do a similar thing that is virtually never going to be a reason to include the card in any deck whatsoever. And at number 7, we have Trial of the Princess, an equipped spell that's supposed to allow Pikaru and Curran to provide themselves more worthy of the throne. But trying to successfully use Trial is more of a tribulation. Fitting to its flavor, it can only be equipped to either a White Magician Pikaru or an Ebon Magician Curran, and gives them both a pretty substantial 800 attack point buff. But Trial also has a secondary effect that you can only activate if either of the Magicians manages to destroy a level 5 or higher monster in battle, and allows you to tribute the Magician so that you can summon out the Princess forms in either Princess Pikaru if you tribute a White Magician, or Princess Curran if you tribute an Ebon Magician. Now, the attack increase of Trial isn't amazing especially when compared to generic equip spells and attack modification cards. But it's at least a decent enough attack upgrade to be able to run both Pikachu and Curran into 2000 attack beat sticks. Although that's where the biggest issue of Trials lies. It's strictly limited to only being able to equip to one of the two magicians. And both Pikachu and Curran are absolutely awful monsters with some abysmally bad burn and life gain effects, depending on which one you summon. Whether you activate Pikachu, you gain 400 life points, while Curran lets you burn your opponent for a measly 300 life points. What makes these effects even worse is that they're incredibly slow, as they can only be activated during your standby phase. So if you want to take advantage of either of them to bring them out in the field on your turn, and then pray that your opponent somehow doesn't manage to deal with them during your turn, so that when it swings back to you, you get an opportunity to use these mediocre effects, which even with Try the Princess equipped, 
is a huge ask considering they have zero protection, making it more likely your magicians will end up failing their trial. But what might be even worse is that it's actually trying to summon their priestess forms. Both Princess Pikaru and Kuran can only ever be summoned via Trial of the Princesses effect and can't be brought in other ways. So you would have to hope that given the Herculean task of keeping your magician alive long enough to be able to beat over a level 5 or higher monster, that they'd be at least somewhat interesting payoffs to do a lot more than their original counterparts. But not only do they have the exact same attack as their magician forms when equal with Trial, but their effects are just as miserably bad and just as slow. With the only difference being that their usual burn and life gain is doubled to 600 burn and 800 life respectively, which is a ton of hoops to jump through for such a mediocre upgrade. That's better off staying in your binder than it is being a potentially dead draw and an already bordering on useless strategy. Trial's attack gain isn't the worst effect in the world, but because it's strictly limited to two terrible monsters, its potential as a card is pretty bleak. Trying to build your game plan around resolving a second effect will likely end up making your strategy actively worse as a result, because of those awful bricks you have to pay for a less than marginal buff that could be better emulated by burn or life gain cards that can do more to impact your life points in a shorter period of time while being way easier to actually use. And at number six, we have Spark Blaster, the signature weapon of Elemental Hero Sparkman. In fact, it's so signature that it can only ever be equipped to Sparkman himself and allows him to target a face-up monster on the field to change its battle position. But if you use Spark Blaster three times, it short circuits and ends up destroying itself. In theory, Spark Blaster is a card that's used as an offensive option that can let Sparkman and your other monsters beat over an opponent's high attack boss monster by exploiting a potentially low defense stat, or to deal a bunch of damage by your opponent's best defender to attack position, or it can instead be used defensively to switch your own monsters to defense position during the turn that they've attacked or been summoned to protect your life points. But in practice, it leaves a lot to be desired. It's not out of the question for equip spells to act as pseudo-removal options that need to flex the battle phase. But the way that Sparkman does so is particularly inconvenient, because while other equip spells would strengthen a monster enough to be able to beat over an opponent's, Spark Blaster doesn't actually do anything to bolster Sparkman's strength. So you have to hope that whatever you're trying to destroy has 1600 or less attack or defense points, which is far from a reliable form of removal, even for an equip spell. And trying to use Blaster defensively is pretty much worthless. If your opponent has a terrifying boss monster looming over your life points, instead of trying to rely on a card like Spark Blaster that's only going to delay the inevitable as your monsters are being over, you'd rather have cards available to deal with your opponent's impending threat rather than letting your field get wiped away. But even in the extremely rare and new situations where Spark Blaster could end up being one of the best cards you could have, it's still entirely reliant on Elemental Hero Sparkman. And Sparkman just isn't an amazing card either. It's a mediocre hero with subpar stats that does virtually nothing. And while it has some okay fusion monsters that it can go into, Sparkman has never really done anything to justify its inclusion in hero focus strategies past the days of Thunder Giant Turbo during GOAT format. And even back then, it wasn't ideal to summon out Sparkman and hope for the best. And Spark Blaster's release did nothing to change or help justify Sparkman's inclusion in any kind of strategy. Even hero focused ones, because trying to force any value out of the card was honestly just as difficult back in the classic days of the game as it would be today. But it's at least funny that you can force your opponent's monsters to dance by just switching its position three times. Hi, I'm the new AI made for the elevator. Would you like to go up or down? Up please, I'm on floor eight. Have you ever considered going down? Um, no thanks, up please. But just think about it for a second. Have you ever considered the benefits of going down? My apartment is upstairs. Right, but if you go down, you can see the premiere of Glitch Stars, June 8th. On the big screen in the lobby, a new VTuber group started by the Duologues. No thanks. Take me up, please. And at number 5, we have the Orb of Yasaka, a piece of spirit support seemingly designed to try and fix one of the core issues of the mechanic, survivability. Yasaka can only ever be equipped to a spirit monster a monster type that has a central mechanic of returning to the hand during the end phase of the turn that they're summoned. So no matter how many spirit monsters you commit to the board, you're going to have an open field by the end of your turn, leaving your life points wide open, which is likely why Yasaka's effect allows you to gain life points equal to the attack of the monster that ends up being destroyed by battle and sent to the graveyard by the equipped spirit monster. It even has a cute bonus effect to circumvent what would usually happen when equipped cards are attached to spirit monsters. Since after Yasaka falls off from a spirit monster that returns to the hand, you get to add it back from your graveyard to your hand. However, despite being designed specifically with spirits in mind, 
Yasaka does such a poor job at increasing the survivability of spirit-focused strategies that it might as well not have an effect. Cards that are made solely for the purpose of gaining life are usually never worth the spot in your deck list, because unless you're on a specific strategy, gaining life doesn't do anything to get you closer to a win condition of reducing your opponent's life points to zero. And while it might feel a lot safer sitting at over 10,000 life rather than 8,000, they're generally seen as a waste of card advantage that could have instead been spent on setting up your board or trying to end an opponent as quickly as possible. And while it might seem like that's going to be an impossible task for spirits, the individual power contained with certain spirit monsters and their support cards allows them to do more than enough to set up interesting interactions that even meta-viable strategies can struggle to play through. And what makes Yasaka worse is that it's not just a life gain card. It's a life gain card that's entirely reliant on the battle phase to function. So if your opponent doesn't commit to a monster, or if their boss monster happens to have too high of an attack point value, Obi Osaka isn't going to do anything to help you live to your next turn. And even if you're rewarded with a hefty 2,000 or more life points, that's not a guarantee that you're going to survive next turn, since while it might make it a little bit harder to push for lethal, most strategies in the modern era are capable of accessing generic OTK enablers. That, it is a lot easier to OTK you no matter your life total, which ensures that the Orb of Yasaka is going to end up going to waste, when it could have been a way to actually stop an opponent's attack or clear away the board. It's a huge shame that Yasaka is as bad as it is, as his second effect working alongside the spirit mechanic is actually really interesting. But for the card to have any kind of viability, its first effect needed to be something entirely different, as gaining life points alone just isn't enough. And at number 4, we have the Scroll of Bewitchment, an equip spell that's essentially one degree away from not having an effect, because all Scroll of Bewitchment does is allow you to change the attribute of the monster you equip it to, to the attribute that you declare. Now, in the last video on this subject, we discussed a card that was really similar in spirit to Bewitchment in Demotion, and explored the interesting but janky ways that you could theoretically make the card useful, since its effect is so impractical that it's unlikely to ever see any real competitive success. And this same is true of Scroll of Bewitchment. Like with reducing your monster's level, changing attributes isn't a negative effect, but you need a decent amount of setup for it to actually be a positive one. Given that Protoss is now unbanned, one way that you can try and use Bewitchment is by equipping it to your Protoss and declaring the main attribute of your opponent's deck, calling Fire if you fear Snake Eyes, or Water if you're worried about Goaty. And then, because you now control the attribute on the field, you can use Protoss' effect to prevent any monster of the attribute from being special summoned, floodgating your opponent out of the game. Or if your opponent happens to be floodgating you instead by using a copy of Goza Match, suddenly Scroll Bewitchment becomes a removal spell. As if they have two or more monsters, you can activate Bewitchment on the one you want to get rid of and change its attribute, and then they'll be forced to send it to the graveyard. You can even just use it as part of your main engine in combination with other silly cards depending on the strategy you're playing. Psychic Arsenal, for example, allows you to add machine monsters from your deck to your hand, depending on the level and attribute of the psychic monster targeted with it. And so, if you summon out a no punk Min, you can use Scroll Bewitchment to change their type to dark, and the Demotion to reduce their level by 2, so that you can use Psychic Arsenal to add a Genix Ally Birdman from your deck to your hand. All of this is purely theoretical, though. You can definitely find situations where Scroll Bewitchment is going to end up feeling like a solid card but trying to make it work in a real duel is usually going to result in disappointment. But even though Bewitchment is undoubtedly mediocre, it's nice to at least have a small break from the negativity to theorize silly combos. And at number 3, we have Morphtronic Rusty Engine, a battered, sputtering, and obsolete version of Morphtronic Engine. And while the original Morphtronic Engine isn't amazing in card either, Rusty Engine is definitely going to make you want the upgrade. Like with the other Morphtronic equipped cards, you can only ever equip Rusty Engine to a Morphtronic monster, and while you'd hope that this Gas Guzzler would give your monsters extra power, it's only going to end up blowing back in your face. Literally, since if the monster equipped with Rusty Engine ends up being destroyed, both players take damage equal to the original attack of that monster. But while on the field, Rusty Engine does a grand total of nothing. It doesn't buff your Morphtronics or give your opponent a downside they need to worry about, it's just an engine that's sole purpose is to explode. So the only way to get any real use out of Rusty Engine is to find a way to destroy your own Morphtronic monster. The easiest way is by crashing your monster, but you can also use end phase effects of Junk Box or Limited Removal. And either way, this is going to be a huge investment of resources since you're giving up both your monster and the equip spell solely to deal damage. Now, it's not entirely unheard of to spend a bunch of cards to damage your opponent's life points, because card advantage doesn't matter that much if your life points have hit zero. In fact, back when Ring of Destruction was a popular staple prior to its errata, it was actually a fairly common play to use Ring on your own monster when your opponent's life points were low enough that it would be just enough to guarantee you won the duel. 
but it's extremely unlikely that a card like Rusty Engine is ever going to end a game in your favor. Currently, the highest original attack printed on a Morphtronic monster is on Morphtronic Scannon, with a grand total of 1500 attack. So if you want Rusty Engine's burn to actually come up, you need to have whittled away your opponent's life points down to 1500 or less. And there's actually a couple of ways you can do this in a Morphtronic focused strategy, either by relying on your burn effects, or by using Borden's effect to allow your Morphtronics to attack directly. However, if you've managed to get your opponent down to such a low life total with either route, you likely wouldn't need Rusty Engine to end the game. If you've been able to stall out long enough for Clock In, Datatron, and Vacuum's burn effect to be relevant, you've likely already had tight control over the game state. While if you use Borden, if you had a Morphtronic whose attack was equal to or higher than your opponent's life points, you wouldn't risk taking damage and crashing that monster, when you can instead just attack directly and win. But in both cases, Rusty Engine is never going to be the clear difference maker. In fact, it's generally going to be a lot riskier compared to more conventional strategies, since you're taking the damage too. So if you can't end the game with Rusty Engine's burn effect, you've not only lost a lot of cards, but you've made it easier for your opponent to end the game. Now, there is a more passive way of using Rusty Engine, where instead of trying to burn your opponent, you can use it as a deterrent to protect your most important Morphtronic monster from being attacked, lest your opponent risk taking damage. But that's not really an effective game plan, because it gives your opponent the choice of whether or not they want to risk it. And if the Mortronic monster is of any importance, they're going to be willing to spend a few life points to get rid of it, if they even end up destroying it at all. Since if they're somehow extremely concerned about the potential burn from the engine, there are a multitude of ways of dealing with the engine or removing an opponent's monster from the field without needing to actually destroy it, which would end up preventing Rusty Engine's burn from activating. There might be a 1 in 100 games where the burn from Rusty Engine ends up coming up, as it can technically end up winning you the duel. But in practice, the card is fittingly unstable and a nightmare to try and make work in even the most dedicated of Morphtronic strategies, and is just as likely to be the reason for your demise. And at number 2, we have Prevention Star an equip spell with one of the most awkward activation requirements in the game. Because you can only ever equip Prevention Star to a monster you control that has changed its battle position from face-up attack position to face-up defense position on the turn that you want to use it. But that's not the end of it either, as your opponent has to have a monster you're able to target as well, and it prevents a said monster from attacking or changing their battle position while Prevention Star is on the field. And if the monster that Star is equipped to is ever destroyed, then your opponent's monster gets banished. These effects make prevention a strange mix of a floodgate and removal, but it fails at being half as good as either would be in any situation where Prevention Star could be useful. Like we discussed with Paralyzing Potion, attack prevention effects have their place in the competitive game. Being able to survive for an extra turn through a potential OTK can be the very reason that you would eventually end up winning a duel. Much like Paralyzing Potion, Prevention Star is only ever going to stop the attack of a single monster at a time, so it's not really going to be the effect that's keeping you alive. You would at least hope that Star's removal effect would put it at a tier or two above some of the other cards on this list, but actually resolving this second effect might just be one of the most unreliable ways of dealing with an opponent's monster in the game, since your two options are either to try and destroy your own monster, or hope that your opponent does it for you. But there are hundreds of different ways for your opponent to circumvent Prevention Star, because of the specific way its condition is worded. Instead of destroying the monster that it's equipped to, they can banish it, return it to the hand or deck, or even just send it to the graveyard with an effect so long as it doesn't destroy it. And if they can't deal with the monster, they can just deal with Prevention Star itself by using any kind of back or removal to get rid of Star so its effect will stop applying, freeing up their monster to attack. And then, even if they have no ways to deal with monsters or back row, it's still not an issue. They still have access to their monster's effect, and can still use it to their advantage. Or they can just use their monster for the summon of another monster before you get the chance to banish it, effectively making it so the Prevention Star was worthless. But that's even assuming that you could get the opportunity to activate Star in the first place, because its activation condition is strangely awkward to fulfill and requires an almost contradictory game state. Your opponent needs to summon a monster that's enough of a threat that you'd actually want to use Star to stop them from attacking with, but not enough of a threat that being able to beat over your opponent's monster for their turn would get you the opportunity to switch your monster to defense position. And so, Prevention Star doesn't really prevent anything. Its abysmal activation condition alone is horrendous. And while other difficult-to-use cards promise an absurd payoff or an exciting moment, Prevention Star is just a slight improvement over Paralyzing Potion at best. So, for a game state where it actually ends up doing anything, you're going to need to do a lot more than just wish upon a star. And slicing into number one spot is a Sword of the Soul Eater, an equip spell that's so demanding that it's just not worth it to try and use. You see, to activate Soul Eater, 
you need to control a level 3 or lower normal monster on your side of the field. And while it's equipped, it has the potential to increase the attack of that normal monster by a maximum of 5,000 points. But there's a catch, because in order to use this power, you need to tribute every non-token normal monster other than the Soul Eater it's equipped to, and that monster will gain 1,000 attack for every monster you tribute it. Admittedly, the idea of Soul Eater is really cool. You can trade a board of unimpressive weaklings that were likely going to be destroyed anyways to turn one of them into a genuine boss monster so that all may fear the power of Jerry Beansman that's capable of defeating an Axis Code Talker. But you're giving up a crazy amount of advantage to make Soul Eater work. In order to even activate the card, you have to flood the field with at least two normal monsters, one to equip to and at least one other to tribute. And if you struggle to commit enough, then Soul Eater just becomes a dead card in your hand. You can't even try to cheat the system by summoning out tokens, as Soul Eater explicitly excludes them. So you have to do it the hard way. And while this isn't an impossible task by any means, Soul Eater demands a lot. Because if you only tribute a couple of monsters, then your vanilla isn't really gaining enough attack to justify the resource sink. But likewise, it's an awful idea to tribute 4 or 5 monsters just to make a huge beat stick. And that's because normal monsters aren't just their stats anymore. If you have the ability to commit a bunch of them to the field, then instead of using them for Soul Eater, you can convert them into a pretty impressive Link-based end board that can shut down even the most meta-viable strategies with the use of enough powerful generic boss monsters and interactions that were summoned through your vanillas. Which is why token generators are particularly dangerous in the modern era, as any card that generates a bunch of free bodies without any kind of restriction is going to result in an absurd end board. So if you found a way to bring a ton of bodies to the field, then activating Soul Eater is solely going to be a detriment as all of your normal monsters are just converted into stats rather than an interesting interaction. But even disregarding how much you give up for Soul Eater, perhaps its biggest crime is that it's not even the most fun thing you can do with a bunch of vanillas. Because if you want a janky strategy based around bringing normal monsters with low stats to the field, you could instead be trying for Law of the Normal, which is not only a lot more fun to resolve when you see your opponent send their entire hand and field to the graveyard, but it's genuinely just a better payoff than a high attack vanilla with no protection. Sword of the Soul Eater is an undoubtedly outdated car that requires a ton of hoops for you to even activate in the first place, potentially eating up an entire hand worth of cards just so you can use it. You might be able to pull off a Celio Decay of the strategy, but it's going to be worse than just about anything else you could have done with the bodies that you get tributed for it. It's just not worth it to spend every one of your resources to summon a 4000 attack Ojama Yellow. And that's the list. If you think there's any equip spills you may have missed, or if you have any ideas for future videos just like this one, please let us know down in the comments below.